uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to be sharing a paper that uh, was just published a few weeks ago, so hot off the presses, uh, with um, Michael Weintraub, who's in the, the audience, and a couple of our friends. Um, the project is motivated by, by two questions. Uh, so first, how can states recovering from civil war avoid an escalation of local disputes during uh, transitions to national peace? And then second, how can states prevent uh, armed groups from exploiting local governance gaps that tend to emerge uh, as other armed groups are demobilizing uh, and, and, and seize territory during these uh, national peace processes? Uh, so the, the core sort of theoretical intuition at the heart of this project is that um, projecting state power uh, into areas that were previously governed by armed groups requires uh, providing mechanisms to resolve disputes. So we know from the literature on rebel governance, including uh, and especially work by Ana Arjona, who's, who's sitting right in front of me and, and other folks in this room, um, that uh, one of the most important ways that armed groups win civilians' loyalties uh, and establish territorial control is by adjudicating crimes uh, and resolving more uh, quotidian disputes. So we argue that establishing peace and, and preventing rebel resurgence at the local level uh, requires providing alternatives to rebel dispute resolution. And, and most existing attempts to provide those sorts of alternatives are either entirely top down, so for example, interventions that focus on improving the performance of the police and the courts, or they are entirely uh, bottom up, so for example, focused on building the capacity of civil society organizations. Uh, and we think this sort of top down, bottom up dichotomy is just fundamentally misguided, uh, and, and that really the most promising ways uh, to, to um, prevent rebel resurgence involve uh, building bridges between these top-down and, and bottom-up institutions. We argue that in particular for, for weak states, states with weak capacity, their most viable strategy for resolving disputes fairly and efficiently is to partner uh, with communal institutions. And, and by communal institutions, we mean uh, localized mechanisms for sustaining order, uh, typically through, through social sanctions rather than through uh, physical force. And if you look around the world, you find tons of examples of these sorts of communal institutions uh, everywhere. Now, we think that communal institutions have some really important comparative advantages over states in post-conflict contexts. Uh, they, they typically enjoy a level of local legitimacy that states often lack. Uh, they tend to be quite uh, socially embedded, and they often have access to um, inside information about the most important sources of disputes at the community level. But they often suffer from, from biases and inefficiencies of their own. So for example, they can resolve disputes in ways uh, that contravene state laws uh, and, and due process protections. Their decisions are often um, unenforceable uh, because they lack a, a, a credible threat of third party uh, coercion. And un unenforceable decisions are problematic because uh, they uh, incentivize forum shopping and, and prevent sort of a, a definitive resolution of disputes. So we argue for an approach that exploits complementarities between state and communal authorities. And this approach uh, involves communal authorities adjudicating um, nonviolent crimes and, and petty disputes, and then connecting with the state uh, to inform state authorities about more serious conflicts. State authorities, for their part, are responsible for, for resolving those more serious conflicts, but then also providing uh, a coercive capacity that can help reinforce communal authorities' decisions, especially when those decisions are unpopular. And we think that this approach is, is a potentially promising way uh, to help states avoid local conflict escalation and prevent uh, new or existing armed groups from, from gaining a foothold uh, as national peace processes are unfolding. Uh, so we're going to test this approach through an experimental evaluation of the Comun Paz uh, program in rural Colombia. Uh, this is a program um, that focused on four regions of the country, uh, four farmer, uh, former uh, FARC strongholds. I think probably most of you guys are, are familiar with, with Colombia, but this is you know, the site of the, the world's uh, longest civil war. There was a peace agreement uh, with the FARC, uh, the largest rebel group in the country uh, in 2016. FARC has, has largely uh, demobilized, but other armed groups are now, are now vying uh, to take the FARC's place. So we were working in places where the FARC had demobilized, but where other armed groups were already uh, starting to, to operate. Hadn't established territorial control yet, but they were definitely active and, and working to try um, to build uh, 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 some, some um, territorial control. We're going to work in 149 communities, 72 of which uh, we randomly assigned to treatment. Um, I'm going to skip a lot of the, the empirical details uh, of the research design, but, but happy to talk about them uh, in the Q&A if you'd like. So this program targeted uh, three sets of actors. So on the side of the state, uh, police commanders and police inspectors. Uh, so commanders are, are responsible for more serious crimes. Police inspectors uh, resolve less serious disputes. 
and then on the side of the community, uh, Juntas de Acción Comunal, uh, uh, sort of communal action boards, which are responsible for maintaining um, harmony at, at the local level. And what's interesting about, about the, the, the juntas is that in many places, not, not everywhere, but in many places, um, the FARC uh, leveraged the juntas to resolve disputes and control the flow of goods and people and, and, and gather intelligence on uh, potential civilian defectors. So in a sense, the intervention that we're evaluating sort of mimicked the FARC strategy, but this time on the side of the state, basically trying to um, leverage the juntas to build state capacity and, and uh, prevent rebel resurgence. The program had, had three basic goals. One was to just provide information to help state and communal authorities understand one another's comparative advantages uh, and, and their legal roles and responsibilities. A second was to build trust, uh, to, to create opportunities for, for citizens uh, and state and communal authorities to interact with one another uh, in a structured, uh, safe, mutually respectful uh, environment and then to help improve coordination. So, so develop and disseminate um, uh, what were called uh, rutas de atención or, or response routes. Basically, uh, you can think of them as sort of decision trees that would help citizens know, you know, if you have a dispute, where should you go to get that dispute resolved, right? And, and, and sort of thinking through, okay, is it violent? Is it not violent? Uh, you know, if it's violent, take it to the state. If it's not violent, take it to the junta. You know, if the junta can't resolve it, you know, take it somewhere else. So basically a, a sort of a, a way for citizens to really understand how they can get their disputes resolved. Uh, so it, it rolled out over four modules. Uh, the first mo module targeted state authorities. Um, second module targeted communal authorities. The third module brought state and communal authorities together uh, to help coordinate their activities and, then, uh, and, and to develop these, these response routes which were tailor-made for each uh, community. And then finally, in, in the fourth module, uh, citizens got together with both the state and communal authorities uh, to disseminate these response routes and help uh, communities understand um, the, these sort of new mechanisms for resolving disputes. Just sort of give you a, a flavor for what this looked like. Here's you know, module one with, with um, police, module two with the juntas, module three, they come together to build these response routes, module four, they disseminate. And really the, the sort of deliverable at the end of uh, this process was something that looks like this. So this is an actual response route. It came, if you look at that picture from, from module three, right? so they're, they're building this response route um, as, as part of the intervention. And then, uh, the, the UNDP and, and, and CEDAC, who, who implemented the intervention, they would turn it into this nice, really polished poster, um, which would get um, handed out as sort of flyers and then, and then posted uh, in, in prominent locations throughout the community to help citizens see um, you know, how these dispute resolution mechanisms really work. So we're gonna combine data from, from multiple sources to evaluate uh, the effects of this intervention. Uh, again, I'll, I'll skip a lot of the, the details, but happy to talk in the Q&A if you'd like. Uh, so we have surveys of, of citizens and both state and communal authorities. Um, these surveys include uh, some, some indirect measurement techniques to try to uh, get at sensitive topics, a, a list experiment to measure reliance on armed groups, an endorsement experience, uh, experiment to measure uh, perceptions of armed groups. This is a survey we conducted about six months after the end of the intervention. So we're looking at sort of medium term effects here. We also have some behavioral measures. Uh, so we created a petition uh, that citizens could sign uh, requesting more involvement of municipal authorities in local dispute resolution. Uh, and then we went back and measured you know, how many citizens actually signed these petitions. We also encouraged uh, local leaders to create WhatsApp groups uh, with uh, police inspectors and police commanders to help coordinate their activities. And we went back and measured whether they actually did that, whether they created those WhatsApp groups. And then we have this really incredibly rich uh, qualitative data uh, from, from field reports that the implementers uh, provided to us that gave us a, a real rich sense of how exactly the intervention unfolded. I'm gonna skip again uh, the regression equation, uh, but again, happy to talk about it in the Q&A. Let me just highlight a, a small handful of results. There's a, a ton in this paper, if you're interested in more, um, but I'll just show you a few uh, quick things. So one, uh, we do observe a reduction uh, in uh, uh, disputes, especially at the community level. So we asked residents about disputes that they themselves were involved in, and then we asked local leaders about disputes that were happening at the, at the community level as a whole. And we observe so a 16% reduction in the prevalence of uh, unresolved disputes in, in, in the community as a whole, and a 25% reduction in the prevalence of uh, violent disputes. So, so, so substantively pretty large effects. We don't really see effects among citizens, which is not terribly surprising because disputes are much more rare when you ask individuals about their own experiences of disputes uh, rather than asking local leaders about disputes in the community as a whole. 
We also observe um, less reliance on armed groups among residents. Now, I should say um, reliance on armed groups was already pretty rare in these communities, which is, is not surprising. Again, we're working in places where the FARC had already demobilized, where other armed groups were, were active but had not yet established territorial control. Uh, so citizens weren't really relying on them yet. Nonetheless, we find that the program reduced reliance on armed groups basically to zero, uh, even uh, despite the, the risk of, of floor effects. Interestingly, we don't find any effect on reliance on the juntas or on reliance on the police and police inspectors. So citizens are less likely to rely on armed groups, no more likely to rely on either the state or communal authorities to resolve disputes. And I'll, I'll say more about that in, in just a second. Finally, uh, we find a, a reduction in perceptions of armed groups. Again, perceptions of armed groups were, were relatively unfavorable, uh, even uh, in the control group. But the program diminished those perceptions even further, again, basically to zero, uh, despite the risk of floor effects. So for example, we find that residents were 47% uh, less likely to express trust in armed groups. Uh, they were 45% less likely to say uh, that armed groups resolve disputes fairly and effectively. Um, we, we don't find significant effects among local leaders, uh, but the, the, the point estimate there, the, the size of the effect is basically uh, the same. It's just not as precisely estimated. We also find that when we ask police inspectors about their perceptions of the juntas, we find an improvement uh, in, in their perceptions as well. We don't find a significant effect on citizens' perceptions or local leaders' perceptions of state authorities as a whole, but if we disaggregate this to look at uh, perceptions of police and perceptions of police inspectors, we actually do find an improvement in perceptions of police inspectors specifically. Um, so, so summarizing there, you basically have police inspectors perceiving uh, local institutions more favorably, local institutions perceiving police inspectors more favorably, and we think that's because um, police inspectors really work uh, quite closely with these communal institutions, especially uh, through this intervention. So for those of you who are familiar with experimental work, you know, you often get uh, some results that make a lot of sense and some results that are, that are harder uh, to understand. Um, so, so one puzzle we found uh, was, was this sort of combination of results where on the one hand, the program reduced the prevalence of unresolved and violent disputes. It also decreased reliance on armed groups, but didn't increase reliance on either state or communal authorities. So um, what's sort of puzzling there is, you know, disputes are being resolved, they're not being resolved by armed groups, but they also don't seem to be resolved by state or communal authorities. So, so who exactly is resolving them? Um, and we think a potential solution to this puzzle lies in the fact that the program appears to have enabled better uh, coexistence and cohabitation within these communities, resulting in fewer disputes to resolve in the first place. So basically, communities much more likely to report that there just aren't as many disputes to resolve, period. And I, I won't go through this in, in detail for the sake of time. So just wrapping up, um, so again, the motivation for this project was that uh, in post-conflict settings or, or, or countries that are transitioning uh, to post-conflict periods, states often struggle to consolidate territorial control in, in former rebel strongholds. We think one way uh, to help facilitate state consolidation is to exploit um, these promising but underutilized complementarities between state and communal authorities. Ooh, that's complementarities, not complementarities. Um, and, and we show one way uh, to try to do that and show that, it, um, that exploiting these complementarities can help mitigate local conflicts uh, and prevent armed groups uh, from regaining citizens' loyalties at the local level as these national level peace processes are uh, unfolding. Thanks a lot. <laughs>